Welcome back to the video lecture series for Introduction to the Art of Programming using Scala. In this video we continue talking about uh, writing things out to file. We're still in the chapter on IO streams, but we're going to break a little bit from, uh, from what we've been doing previously and look at, we're going to kind of take a detour down the path of serialization, which you will recall from the previous two videos, is taking our data and turning it into some form that we can send across a network or store in a file or whatnot so that later or on the other side we can read it back in and reestablish the objects that we had before. Now previously we looked at how we could do binary serialization either by writing our own code for doing it with say a, uh, a data output stream um, and then we looked at how there is a mechanism built into Java and the JVM that allows us to do default binary serialization and we saw that it was actually very easy to make it so that objects would serialize though there was a certain level of care that needed to be taken when dealing with them. For this video I want to introduce kind of the idea of XML serialization. Now this really isn't too far from things that we did a number of chapters ago when we were looking at XML uh, but I kind of want to be a little bit more specific about it here and, and look at kind of this pattern of how we can write uh, functions so that we can take our objects and convert them to XML and then have code that converts them back. So the idea is that I would like to have the ability to convert shapes uh, into XML. Okay. Uh, and the idea is that if I have a whole sequence of, of nodes of, of things I could take each one of those and pass it to some function and it would figure out which type of shape it, it was and then recreate those for us and then also I want to be able to get XML. And so I'm basically going to do two things to make this happen. Inside of the shape itself the actual serialization code is going to be called 2XML. I'm only using this in one place here, so I'll go ahead and put xml.node. And I want this to return an XML node to us, okay? which of course means that the circle and the rectangle and then my other uh, mutable, the rectangle and the square, will need to have this method. I will go ahead and in the mutable version, paste equals just something very short and simple but valid for there and then oh and the mutable square inherited from it okay so because the reality is I don't care about those what I do care about is the circle and the rectangle so how would they go about converting themselves to XML well there are some different ways that we could do this I am actually for reasons that you uh, the will possibly become clear later on, I tend to want to make this so that we have a XML node that's name is shape because that's the super type. Uh, the real reason for this is it is much easier whereas if I make these called circle and rectangle remember when you're searching through XML you do something like this this would pull out all the circle nodes and then I could do it again for rectangle. But what if I want to pull out all of the shapes and then do different things depending upon whether they're circles or rectangles or whatnot? Well then it's nice to have it so that the node name is the super type that I want and then they would have attributes that specify which type they are. So for example something like that. <clears throat> okay, so this would uh, give us our, we have a shape, it has a type of circle, and then I need the data that goes inside of, of the circle. Uh, I made this so that it's not necessarily an empty node, but in the case of the circle it's fairly simple. We have a radius, which is going to be equal to radius dot to string and a color which needs to be equal to 
C dot, um, I'm going to just write out the git RGB to string. And there we go. Okay, so this is, when we call this on a circle, it will give us a shape node in XML, and we can take that uh, shape node and do whatever we want. Probably our main task is going to be writing it out to file. If we are in the rectangle, there is no radius, there is a width and a height. And so we'll copy that and paste. Okay. Um, an interesting thought here on the color. It's possible that we might actually, if we were going to have more things inside of shape that were kind of shared between these, uh, that we would want to delegate that and that we would have another function in here one that wasn't abstract, it was concrete, and it would give us a node sequence of all of the things that we would put inside of every shape, uh, but in this case that's not not something that I need to do. So the rectangle gives a width, a height, and a color, and the idea here is that I want to have ways of deserializing these. So I've, I've written basically the code that serializes it. It converts it from the object into a form which I can store or send or, or do something with. In this case, it happens to be an XML form. On the other side, we want to deserialize this. So I'm going to go ahead and I normally do my deserialization. I think this is a, is a good pattern to get used to. To put this inside of the companion object and to write an apply method that takes an XML node. Okay. So we have the apply method, it takes an XML node and it is supposed to return to us a shape. Right now that shape could be either a uh, circle or a rectangle. Now which one it is though is going to depend upon the type, the, uh, the value that is stored in the uh, parameter called type. So I could do something like this, node slash at type to pull off that parameter, match. One case is if it's a circle, and let's actually do this text. Another case, if it is a rectangle. Something to note here, uh, this is, I have these kind of what you might refer to as magic strings that are occurring. Um, this is somewhat bug prone in that if I mistype this, okay, like that, uh, and as you've seen watching these videos, I'm prone to do stuff like that. I think most programmers are. Uh, that, that's not a compile error. Uh, that happens to be perfectly, uh, it, your code still compiles just fine, and so you don't notice it until later on when you're going through and you're debugging, and hopefully you write a test case that trips that, uh, and if you don't, then you ship it to a customer, and then they do that, and they get upset with you. Uh, so one way of getting around this would be to put a companion object for the circle and have it define a, a constant uh, for, for the type, so we could do something like object circle um, val type string equals circle. Good example of the fact that I can't type it. And so then this here changes to circle dot type string. And as you saw there, in this case, if I mistype it, I actually get a syntax error. Okay, I would have called it just type, except for the fact that type is a keyword in there. 
Um, so this approach is probably preferable to actually typing the strings out each time, simply because it is better at telling you when you mess something up. So in the case of circle, I need to get the radius. And I could put this all in one line, but I don't feel like it. I would rather break it out a little bit. So the radius is simply equal to node dot, uh, sorry, node slash, and we made all of these things attributes, radius dot text dot to double. And then we have a val for the RGB is equal to node slash at color dot text dot to int. And so then I can return a new circle of radius and new color of RGB. The code for our rectangle is going to be very similar. It's not going to have a rate. Now, one thing to note, at this point, this all compiles. Uh, and even after I change this to rectangle, so width and height, and of course the errors are going to tell me that I need to change these things, so they are called width and height. And I save and all my errors go away. Uh, but it shouldn't take you long to look at this and go, oops, we have a problem. If I were to run this code and try to, to deserialize something, it wouldn't work very well. Because I have to make sure that the XML tags that I'm looking up are match my the variables or where it is in, in my constructor. Okay, so note that the XML serialization really has uh, about the same approach as if we had done our own binary serialization. Uh, of course, if you're gonna do binary serialization, in most cases, it's probably easier to go with the default serialization. Uh, your own might be a little bit more efficient, though it will take significantly more coding to do. The XML serialization is a way to get things out in XML, which is quite honestly a, a more flexible and broadly usable format. There are some drawbacks here. Uh, just like there were with the default serialization. One of the big drawbacks for XML is that there are certain types of data that XML is just not good at representing. Uh, any large data set, XML is probably not ideal. Uh, that whole thing with lots of doubles, not good for XML. But another instance would be what we talked about in the last video of a buffered image. How do you write a buffered image out in, in XML? And it turns out the answer to that is not nicely. Um, you can find ways of encoding that buffered image inside of a string or whatnot, but really buffered images are should be written out in, in a binary format, preferably in some type of encoded format. And so what your XML might do is to then refer to some other file, you know, some PNG or some JPEG, something like that, uh, and give a file name. And then when you do the saving off of the XML, you also save off the images, assuming that they're going to change. So that's an introduction to how you could do serialization in, the, in an XML format. Uh, I didn't um, go through and, and actually, I could take the shapes and I could map them to, to XML and build that and write out to a file the XML and then invert the process, <clears throat> read them back in. Uh, but hopefully this was sufficient detail that you can see how that would work for doing that serialization. Yeah. So this covers all of the main topics for, uh, for looking at the stream IO. I wanna come back in the next video and apply some of these things to, to the E-Class project and just see how they would uh, fit in there.